<laughs> so yeah, as, there we go. As Maria had, had just mentioned, um, this is a book that just came out. You can download a free copy online. It's free open access. Um, but I still don't have my hands on the real copy yet. So I, I feel like it's it's out, but not quite. So so I think you guys get to think of this as as still a very new book um, and in not quite a preview anymore, but almost. So this this book, I, I think I'll just give you just a little bit of background to it, um, but also tell you that, you know, it, in 30 minutes, you can never tell the whole argument of a book, but tell you how I I sliced it and then give you a little sense at the end of what all I've left out. Um, so like many of you guys, I imagine that um, environmental problems are one of those things we all know about. There's a crisis going on. We see all kinds of pictures. It's in the news day to day, even more and more than five years ago and 10 years ago. We do research, we do science, we do analysis. Many of us political ecologists doing the political analysis and stepping out onto the street and demanding that change happens. And I was born in 1980. So in the 1980s, even then, awareness was growing. Most people said they believe environmental problems are real, they believe they're important and something should be done. Those numbers fluctuate over time and space, but still, for 40 years now, most of us have known something is bad and something needs to be done. And so whilst many people are still working on convincing people of the data and the science, what I want to do in this book is to push past that towards the next step and to say, well, the reason why we are struggling is not because we don't know. It's because there's we do know. We just don't agree on what should be done. And so this book is really written to start trying to more clearly answer the question, what should we be done? How do we think about what should be done? And political ecology is one of those fields that spent a lot of time talking about critique and what's wrong, valuable, useful. I think many of us are keen to also include more critical conversations around what comes after the critique. So I was sitting in this space talking with Tyler in 2000, 2019 into 2000, when, as we all know, crisis became much more a part of many of our everyday lives. And writing this book became, in some ways, I would say, what, what got me through the pandemic. Um, it became a moment to say a lot of possibilities are being opened right now. A lot of people are interested in change. And I want to write through it towards what next? And so we came up, yeah, we had to conv convince the publisher that enough was enough of a title. They were like, oh, that's a, that's a word. But then when they read the text, they were like, okay, that, yeah, you're right. That is definitely what this book is about. So we start off the book with enough and they're like, we're sick of this enough sense. And then pivot towards the second meaning of enough, which is to say we're en enough of the bad, but also as environmentalists, as political ecologists, I think there is enough. And I'm not gonna write another book trying to quantify that and tell us how many calories a day we can all consume and how much energy is truly sustainable, but know that literature well enough to believe that it says there is enough for all. We can have the metric quantified conversation, but I'm interested in, again, what, what comes after that? What are the politics that enable the world where we do have enough for all. And so we frame that argument speaking into conversations in political ecology. You can see from a couple of years ago where um, the, I've skipped ahead a little bit. So we'll start, let's start off with a long history of environmental studies. My background is in environmental studies. So I was trained to think about as an American, Pinchot and Muir debates and bring in these different ways of understanding through the environmental movement. But there's a long history of modernist conservation, we're gonna fix it through science. Arcadian environmentalism, we need to commune with nature and live in harmony. And that long, long, long history is shaping ongoing debates, which are in many ways most prominent in the language of degrowth and socialist modernism, eco-modernism, that I imagine many of you have seen on Twitter by some charismatic and direct and emotional debates happening in very short texts. 
between these two really different versions of environmentalism, one that Paula Robbins calls an environmentalism of less and one an environmentalism of more that says we don't need to change much, just use science and technology to advance. So that's the big picture context for kind of where I launched. And I know your urban studies, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring it in there in just a second. So that's the, the big environmentalist political ecology framing. And again, if you wanna get famous on Twitter, being extreme is a very good way to do it. But I have yet to meet anyone who's not one of the five famous Twitter white men. That's the part that gets me in trouble on the internet, but there it is, it's true, Every, all those iconic names. Most of us don't believe either side. Most of us think that this is an extremist debate between two extremes and both of them are wrong. Neither of those worlds are ones that I think would be very compelling, nor do I believe are actually possible, politically, ecologically, different reasons for both. So as this debate was happening, as I was kind of going back to reread some of my old texts around, I use the word Arcadian as the other thing than modern degrowth is a messy label and we can talk more about its messiness. I, I think it's analytically useless. Like it used to mean something. People who use it now use it to mean something different. So we, we kind of write around that term um, and use Arcadian to mean that sharper alternative to the modern. So I was trying to position our thinking within this wider debate, I went, well, what's the alternative? What, what's the not Arcadian? What's the not modern? What's the version of environmentalism that lots of us think is neither of those? And I kept thinking someone else would have a word for it. And after several years of reading, I continued to find that no one else had a word for it. And so, this book and the writing that I've been doing um, about infrastructure is trying to answer, trying to name, trying to draw on many, many other people who have ideas that don't fit into either of those categories and to name it, package it, and then think about, for me, the more exciting part, what's the politics that draw from that other way of understanding the world? So for the urbanists, here we go with something a little more concrete and urban. I'm going to take an infrastructural detour through that debate. So many of you, I imagine, are familiar with modern infrastructure. Even if not the term, we use it. It's what most of us in the global north have in our homes and in our work. Um, I study toilets, which the nine-year-olds in the other room think is awesome. Most people don't, but you're going to get a lot about toilets for the next 10 minutes. So here we go. Toilets, modern infrastructure. Most of us have used it. It looks like this picture in the middle here. It's a flushing toilet. The whole city is connected to one sewer. I mean, it's not always, but in the modern ideal, the whole city is connected to one grid. Nature comes in and trash goes out. And folks have written about the politics of this ideal and the main line of critique coming from splintering urbanism, which is hiding behind all of us there, that book on the right, um, is that this modern ideal used to exist, even if it didn't exist as infrastructure, it existed as an aspiration. And they're concerned that neoliberalism in the 80s, 90s broke that ideal. That's the narrative of splintering urbanism and the politics, the political demand is we should get that ideal back again. The material part of that is, and we should build modern infrastructure to fulfill this demand that everyone gets the same kind of infrastructure all across the city, one big urban metabolism. Now folks writing from the global south, have pushed back against that narrative on several fronts. Um, and one of them is to say that thinking about modern infrastructure and the modern infrastructure ideal, in some ways it was universal as an aspiration. You can find that aspiration, I think in every city. But of course, many, most all global South cities were much further away from meeting that goal of universal uniform, one big grid. That bit, I think, is uncontroversial. What they also said, though, was that by focusing on that narrative, 
the narrative of modern infrastructure, we focus on what the Southern cities don't have instead of focusing on what they do. And that critique, about 10, 15 years old now, has led to a flourishing of studies of informal infrastructure as the way that people do access goods and services, material flows in Southern cities. There's been a lot of literature explaining that this infrastructure works differently, no surprise. All that literature is really interesting and, and about five, 10 years ago for me, that was where I was situating my work, thinking about how we do this. And the politics of this are complicated. And I think we often don't write them into those studies because we focus on the academic task. We're gonna explain how it works differently. And the politics are about the centering of this different thing. But is it good or not is sort of not always easy to answer. So the politics are this are to oppose the demolitions, sure. Celebration of what is complicated. And if you read this through development studies, yes, it's tricky to sit as a white global north academic and say whether this infrastructure is good or not. And I think we have to acknowledge this literature feeds into development studies and, and off of that uncertainty about our role. That's the academic literature. But in practice, in global South cities, nobody is sitting around waiting to decide whether this is good or not. People are doing stuff. People are building, people are experimenting. And so the, the what I would call the Southern practice of response to the lack of the modern infrastructure ideal is to keep building, to keep innovating, to keep experimenting. A lot of this connected to global networks, a lot of this connected to global funders. Five years ago when I first said this, it was fairly controversial. I think it's less so now, but still a little controversial. More and more places are building these alternatives as replacements, not while waiting for the modern infrastructure to come later, but saying that this is actually the permanent infrastructure. We're building this not as temporary, but as permanent. A shift away from whatever word you want to use, networked, grid, modern, towards these smaller kinds of infrastructure that are different, they're diverse, they're happening all over the place. And the, the third point here that I want to speak to, then how, how do we understand these different kinds of infrastructure? As an academic, it becomes my job to, what do these infrastructures tell us about cities and justice and sustainability? And one, one kind of quick and easy answer, Patrick Bond is a South African, I think, political ecologist, um, is to say these are racist because they're different these are problematic. They are about differentiation in really dangerous, racist, apartheid ways. So that critique is definitely out there. I have to say, I, I understand where he's coming from, um, but I think the answer is more complicated than to just dismiss different because it's different, it is therefore wrong and bad. Racist, unjust, unequal, lots of different words. So what I want to do is to use that infrastructure, draw us back to the environmental studies debates around modernity and Arcadia, and say, well, what? how can these different toilets help us understand an imaginary of the world, a set of beliefs about what is possible, a set of beliefs about what justice really means if justice is not sameness for everyone? So I think this, these toilets, but also you could use other examples, but I, I'm going to stick with the toilets. These toilets help us to understand a different way of understanding what is possible. So we've got the modern infrastructure ideal. In the classic text, they talk about what infrastructure is, they talk about what an ideal is, and they call it modern without telling us why modern is the right word. I think it is the right word. But in several of the publications I'll, I'll point you to later, I, I think there is a, a skip over there in terms of spelling out what is modern about that ideal. And so some of the publications are about spelling out, well, the modern ideal is uniform. That's a modernist value. He believes in systems. That's a modernist way of doing science. There are experts who sit above. Users are supposed to flesh and 
call a plumber if something goes wrong. These projects are big. They are related to big water systems. Okay. Again, and that's based on a particular way of understanding the world that is modernist that has been well charted in environment and development studies. I think many, most of us these days don't believe that modern science is a good representation of how the world really works. I think in practice, we still struggle to say that. And also to then say, if we let go of modernity, then what? What next? And so much of this book is trying to articulate the something else. It takes us a while to stage the argument for it to make sense, but really the book is mostly trying to answer that question. The other easy answer is, right, again, Arcadia is the opposite. Arcadia doesn't really help us very much when we're thinking about toilets. You, you can see a composting toilet in a rural area as Arcadian. How much does that help us? Not in an urban context. The Arcadians would say we need low density, spread out composting toilets for all. Again, postmodern is a word that happens in the literature. I could have a longer conversation about why I don't think it's very useful, but those are what happen when you Google postmodern toilets, the gold one and the duck down there. Um, so again, we need something else if we're going to try to identify what's, what's the alternative toilet. What's the way of understanding the alternative toilet that helps us build good and just cities? So again, even if the Googling of a toilet doesn't tell me what those alternatives are, in Southern cities and some Northern cities, I know in Amsterdam you have a few of these, we are already experimenting beyond the binaries, beyond composting toilet and modern flushing toilet. And so what I wanna do in the book in the next few minutes is to say, what do these other toilets tell us about what's possible in the world, about how we understand the world? Okay, so again, there's the same thing again. So we go back to Kampala, Etiquini is um, the municipality of Durban, and to think through what, what that tells us about the understanding of the world. So we see that infrastructure is diverse. Again, some people think this is bad. If you're a modernist, diversity is inherently something we want to move past and beyond. But users and conditions, they vary. And in this context, I think it's reasonable to say the toilet should vary because nature is diverse, because users are diverse. And Cecilia is coming to do a, a postdoc with me and going to be doing some work in Cape Town. This is from her PhD work, which again, a useful example here of arguing for laws that will enable the already existing diversity because that diversity enables more people to use toilets more safely more of the time. Not because it's perfect, but because it's an already existing solution that is better than the alternatives that are existing. Again, that's a core piece of this narrative. Modernity had a teleological endpoint that we knew and we were supposed to move up the ladder to get better and better and eventually mass consumption as our ultimate goal. Arcadia is a reversion, right? We used to be good, we used to be in harmony. We wanna go backwards to that old vision of community, of harmony with nature. What a modest imaginary that we're trying to tease at is to say, be, you can get rid of modernity without saying that the good future can be derived from the past. So the way that folks are talking about these infrastructures is that they can be about improvement. Improvement is still possible. Improvement is still part of our goal. It's a thing we believe in, but the infrastructure of the future looks different. One of the in areas that I'm um, really trying to think through right now is, is what this means for the different roles and relationships of people in cities. We know what modern governance looks like. I mean, it, in practice, it falls apart and fails, but we know what it's supposed to look like. But governing these diverse toilets can't be done in the same way as governing modern infrastructure. So we find more people with more diverse roles. We have different economic models. Again, many of the classic socialists think that paying to use a toilet is bad. I think my own kind of emergent sense is that 
in many places, if there's not a payment associated, the cleaning and maintenance doesn't happen. You run that through the state and the money doesn't come back. So the key point here is not to tease out all of the details, but to say that what governance looks like has to be different. Our understanding of nature is also really different here. Again, easy to understand the binaries. Harmony, we're gonna live and commune with nature in our composting toilet. Here, we're gonna control nature. In urban political ecology, lots of writing on what a modern aspiration of control entails and the big mega projects through which we will channel nature to make it do what we want. What folks are, are talking about with these different kinds of toilets is to say, we know nature is unpredictable. We ex not accept it because we like it, but we are gonna design our toilets as if the world isn't gonna go well, as if things are going to change. What's a toilet design? What's a toilet governance? What a set, a set, of, so, a set of social and economic relations that are responsive to these changes. Can a toilet, what toilet, what kind of toilet handle all of that? So what we see, and I, if you are all engineers, we talk more about the toilet designs. If you're environmental studies people, we talk more about the imaginary, but, but I'm trying to give you the urban slice here. The urban slice is to say, well, the, the way we think about what infrastructure is and what it does is different when we think about it through the solutions being proposed for sanitation in Southern cities. So I use these sites not to say that they've figured it out. They know they haven't figured it out. Not me telling them that. All the folks we've talked to are very clear that the final answer is not on the table yet. Experimenting with different technologies, experimenting with different social relations, experimenting with different economic models, but with a whole bunch of different assumptions about how the world works and what should be lying underneath them. So we've teased out this imaginary. Again, nobody says we have this imaginary. We're trying to tease it out out of the practices and technologies that are emergent. And to suggest that this way of doing toilets really resonates with a lot of contemporary social and, ecolo social and ecological theory. So in the book, we have a whole chapter that's kind of tracing who do we agree with, who do we not agree with. Um, but, that, but that by pulling on these different threads, there's little bits like community economies, the Gibson Graham, there's little bits like Eric Olin Wright and his anti-capitalist futures. Um, but I think pulling across some bits of resilience, which I know is a dangerous word for political ecologists, but some bits of resilience really do resonate with what we're trying to talk about here. What we're trying to do is to draw across those different literatures and name this imaginary. I think there's a lot of power in language and words and that part of our collective struggle has been, we are left with Arcadia and modern. And even though many of our practices sit beyond that, even though many of our beliefs sit beyond that, we don't know how to name and see our allies. So I felt very big and bold and very immodest in trying to come up with a word, but I, I increasingly think this one works. It's not a perfect word. It, it's hard to convince people that there's radical potential in this at first, but then you talk about the ideas and they're like, I mean, for a modernist to believe they can't control nature is a modest statement. For an Arcadian to say, actually, we don't live in harmony is a modest statement. And that, as I'll try to point to in a few minutes, um, much of what we're trying to do is to say we need to build as if we aren't going to know and as if everything isn't going to be resolved and peaceful and always work out. So we try to articulate this modest imaginary and then think about, well, what are the politics that would emerge from this modest imaginary? Okay, so most of the book is actually trying to answer that question. So I've talked to you mostly about the infrastructure slice to say there's a lot of toilets here, but we can also draw on different kinds of infrastructure to think about this modest imaginary. Um, we're doing some work on flooding and how the flood technologies are differing than they used to be. Some work, not my work, but an interesting paper with a different vocabulary and very similar set of questions around energy. What would modest energy look like? 
How does it differ from the Arcadian imaginary and the modern imaginary? So we've put together this chart, which is part of why I shared the slides in case you want to look at it more slowly. I'm going to zip through it. That's contrasting these two different ways of trying to build infrastructure. I'm going to skip here. We might need to come back to that in the thing, but it's to say we're not saying bad infrastructure for poor people, good infrastructure for rich people. We're saying even my toilet is unsustainable. Absolutely. We in the UK know this more than many with the sewage flowing out into the rivers. But it's to draw back out again, it's not just about the infrastructure, it's about a different way of understanding the world. And most of what we've talked about for the last half hour is this top corner here, modest technology and modest science and the, what the modest ecology tells us is possible for infrastructure. But I think you can imagine how much that would shape how we build cities differently. Infrastructure is one of those things that kind of Oh, not glues, but connects the city, right? And that there's political power in that. And we lose some of that when we talk about these more pocketed, localized versions of infrastructure. So some interesting questions there to think through around the, the implications of this for what a good city is, how a good urban metabolism works. But instead of answering those questions, in the book, we go bigger and broader. We talk about what this means for economies, pushing back against both classic socialism, which is often very modernist, pushing back against capitalism for all its many flaws and problems and critiques, but trying to articulate what a modest economy would look like. I mentioned to you on the slides about infrastructure, about thinking about the role of the state. So we have a chapter that thinks through how would the state act differently? Not if everybody who works for the state suddenly became modest, that's and unreasonable, but if our political demands became for the state to act modestly, what demands would we collectively make? Again, I don't mean modest as small, I mean radical demands that were not about state expanding its biopolitical power, but about a radical change that redistributes power one of the examples we talked through there is basic income as what I think of as my kind of most telling example of a different version of statecraft, where the goal is redistribution. It is still economic. Economic doesn't mean capitalist. Markets are not inherently capitalist. Markets existed before capitalism. Money is not always capitalist. All of those slippages we have to, to clarify. Otherwise, if we could... Not all basic income is used for anti-capitalist projects, but what we argue is that it can be. And we use it as an example of a way one can make a demand from the state for redistribution. But what you're actually doing is reducing the power of the state to determine how we live our lives. So we talked in the book through, and, and those are the core chapters, right? We set the stage around these core debates, thinking about modest science and modest technology, um, but then also try to tease out, well, what are the, implications of this for different ways of understanding what is possible and desirable and how that varies from classic modern, from classic Arcadian politics, economics, and livelihoods. So I put a bunch of questions up there as questions that often come up at this stage, happy to talk more through them. Um, but but just to kind of kick the ball up and, and around and to say there's all kinds of things that I don't have great answers to. Happy to riff on it a little bit, but to point you towards some of the things we're thinking about. Um, kind of the, the tension between saying people are responding to the limitations of modern infrastructure pragmatically, or are they really thinking differently about the world? I, I think that's not a straightforward binary what these different pressures are that are pushing the infrastructure. Is it climate change that's making us think differently? Is it poverty that's making us think differently? Again, I think the answers to those vary. Um, yes, there are big development donor interests that those of you who know the toilet stories, absolutely. There's Bill Gates money behind this. Does that inherently make it bad? I, I wanna push back against the over simple, but it definitely complicates how we read the narrative. Again, is this modest shift real? Where is it happening? What sectors, what kinds of infrastructure? Is it good? I was a lot more circumspect a few years ago. I, I feel like I am 
closer to saying, I think I believe this is the way things should be headed and that this is a good shift. Um, again, to point to the questions we said for, for the urbanists in the room, what does this mean for the urban metabolism, for the urban sustainability, for what even a city is? What's it mean for progress and justice? So I'll finish with a little advertising. So there's the book, but there's also a chapter in a um, also very recent, lovely book that has just come out there. So there's a chapter where we try to tease out the modern and, and a paper in urban studies um, that's trying to, so the, the book, there's some infrastructure threaded all through it. Tyler can speak more um, to some of those, those bits and pieces about different kinds of infrastructure in the book. But for the infrastructure pieces there, they're charted out in a little bit differently in, in more detail in those other pieces. So again, there's the funding and the thank you. And again, Tyler is here in the room and so he can share some of the, the question and answer pieces with me, but to also recognize that a lot of the, um, the empirics around different kinds of toilets in different places have come from work that I've done with students who have been really in a whole bunch of different places lately. So acknowledging them there. Thanks for your time and attention. And I, the few times I have been giving this conversation, uh, giving this presentation, um, there has been no shortage of questions. And so from your faces over the last little while, I feel confident that uh, we will have plenty to talk about soon. Thank you so much, Mary, uh, and I thank you, Tyler, for being here as well. We're delighted to have you both. Thank you for this uh, wonderful book you put together and for this uh, talk, which indeed I'm sure raises a lot of questions and a lot of interest. Uh, so I will pass on to Francesca to coordinate the discussion now. And I have questions, but I'll wait, comments rather, but I'll wait uh, for others to go first. Thank you for the talk. I want also to thank you for the presentation. I was familiar indeed with the concept of infrastructure, but I definitely enjoyed the way you let us go through the whole theoretical background, uh, uh, not only from the toilet <laughs> examples. So, um, I want to leave the floor for questioning. Um, maybe we can start with the two questions, please raise your hand whoever wants to ask a question. Debra and Tate. Okay, we collect these two and then we go on. Would you like me to put them in the chat? I wrote them down even. Uh, I think it's nicer if you spell them out and then yeah, you can also put them on the chat for of course. Okay. Um, so I have three, I'm going to try to make them one. Um, and they, uh, thank you so much. I, um, just read the introduction and I am in a writing struggle moment in my life. And I loved the writing and the pace and the, the exposition of, yeah, of this, uh, argumentation that was beautiful also in the face of polarization. So I, I was really inspired. Thank you so much for this uh, book, um, which I'll read all of later, but I just read the, so my questions are kind of, um, you can tell that I just read the introduction. Um, so what I'm wondering about is how you imagine working with existing institutions to make uh, trajectories for, um, yeah, the recalcitrant institutions and with a, a lack of trajectories that are not built uh, institutions, our governance doesn't have, uh, yeah, trajectories for change always, especially as you trickle down. Um, and also, uh, I have some questions concerning these meritocratic uh, notions of labor. Um, and you mentioned these three cores, these three core pillars of a modest approach, uh, which I, I love this emplaced sustainability, entangled autonomy, anticipatory guidance. So it's like really grounded um, positions for uh, taking a position and uh, and propose for proposal, and so how can these uh, pillars uh, 
combat hegemonic cultural notions of meritocratic uh, work valorization. And also it's counterbalance how, it, how consumption in, uh, in populaces feels meritocratic. And that would be a very, it seems to me a difficult uh, thing to defuse, to de-weaponize this uh, consumption that is meritocratic. Those are three clouds of questions. <laughs> Maybe since Deborah's question are pretty rich, Mary, would you like to answer now or shall we take uh, Tate's questions as oh, well? I won't ask mine. It's too much in a different direction and those are clustered, so it doesn't make sense. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> Tyler, I don't know if you, I was saying it's very early for you, but I also <laughs> want to make space for you to jump in or. Uh uh, I can jump in second. Um, I'm still reading. Oh. Yeah, no, no pressure, no problem. Um, and and so I I I think um some of it, yeah. I, I, hopefully, as you read, we we do answer some of it. But I think yeah. some of what you've you've provoked here is also questions that are going to be the next round for for thinking together and jointly. And part of why I've appreciated the opportunity to talk with different groups of people here is. This is the, the book it go, is so much bigger than me and Tyler. Um, mm -hmm. th there's no way we do this on our own. It's not that kind of a book. It's really meant to say the, um, we're pulling on a whole bunch of threads here. And part of why we we had to cut back on the reference list, sadly, but we pushed back to keep it very long because what we're really trying to do is draw threads across a whole bunch of people who don't speak to each other. Yeah. And, and so I think that there is a shared imaginary across a whole bunch of literatures, but also that sometimes the political implications aren't quite linked up. And so in, in terms of your, your first question, I know that seemed a bit off, but I, I think it's useful for understanding. I, I think in terms of movements and institutions, I think we have a lot more allies than I thought we would three years ago when we started having this conversation. Um, and some of that is that I think COVID and the world and AI have really shifted basic income to the forefront of conversations in a way that I had certainly not expected. Um, and, and so part of what we're trying to do here is to show how those synergies can make existing institutions, existing processes, existing politics be channeled even slightly differently. And where to think through where those leverage points are. And so um, I was mentioning earlier, I was at a, a post work conference. I really am not a great fan of the, the title, but I, I think it links to your, um, your second and your third questions around, um, I think the politics of redistribution is, really on the table in a way that it hasn't been in my political lifetime. In part because the pandemic meant we're rethinking work and because yes, some of the post-work folks have been putting that out there, but also the Global South has for hundreds of years, again, not a monotonous unit, but that many people in the Global South in many different contexts have been saying, this is, this is not the life. This is not the life we want. And even when full-time work is available, people often don't take it up. And then there's the whole chapter five about livelihoods goes through some of those older literatures, those longstanding political opposition to, to work. And it often gets misread by socialists as opposition to capitalism. It's opposition to full-time work, full stop. Not You don't wanna be a zombie regardless of whether it's a cooperative or not. And so I think recentering those Southern literatures has been really important to me, again, and put them in conversation with the post-work, but the post-work kind of misses them. So I think in the Global South, a lot of this polit political agenda is already on the table. It's that we in the academic North misread it sometimes. Um, so we're trying to draw, to draw some of your questions across. It's to say the politics of basic income in the Global South has largely been work isn't good, work isn't fair, work isn't what I wanna spend my whole life on. And there is enough, there already is enough. We just need to distribute it differently. 
So in some ways, I, I think part of why Tyler and my story came out the way it came out is we've both been working kind of on the margins in post-colonial theory and said, these debates are more compelling outside the core. And I think there's a, an interesting and, and useful thing for us to think about, well, what would this mean for institutions in the global North? I know the answer to that a lot less well. I, I think the, the modern vision works better here, it doesn't work, but it's a lot closer to being beneficial for lots of people. Um, and, and so I'll maybe kind of trail off at the end with saying, I, I think what this means for institutions in the South is easier because there are political movements and beliefs and channels for building differently in ways that are already politically compelling. We're getting rid of my flushing toilet is really not happening anytime soon in Edinburgh. I, bet, I know that didn't answer every little piece of all the details, but I, I'm trying to, to weave across the clouds a little bit there. Great questions. Um, can I just add a tiny awesome. piece? Yeah. Um, so I think the other piece for me that is like thinking uh, through, I don't, well, I'm in the north. I'm actually in the like far north right now. Um, so, but we can imagine this as like so far north that it's south again. Yeah. Um, so I think that one of the things that I would also say is in the particular moment we're in with the kind of high tech solutions or proposed solutions, actually a number of these things are, um, you know, uh, there are concerns throughout society about automation, but uh, what they're doing on the margins is actually really thinning out what we're poor offers already. Um, so, for instance, I've done a lot of work on pipelines and, and extraction. Um, the Canadian tar sands is now moved to automated automobiles. So the limited northern job offers um, are a road. People are getting replaced by robots and just dealing with environmental waste. Um, so I think that part of it is also, you know, how badly marginalized, I mean, not to push against the hope that I'm trying to articulate otherwise, but I do think that these aren't just stern questions because these technologies, when they get implemented on the margins, like further exacerbate um, kind of what have been brutal inequalities. Um, and I think from those places, like, um, it makes the labor crisis, the governance crisis, like that much more acute because, you know, the governance fix to legitimize like these extractive projects for indigenous people was, oh, we're giving you jobs um, and therefore it's to your benefit. Um, and I think that those kinds uh, of um, legitimations are falling away in a way that like makes questions open in a contestable in a new and different way. This actually leads quite nicely into what I wanted to ask. So that worked out well for me. Uh, uh, Cause I'm, I'm spending this week at, a, at an institution in the Netherlands. And my question is very embedded. Uh, I'll leave it at, I'm at a conference on transdisciplinary research at a different university. And that's as much as I'll say about it for now. A lot of the things you've been talking about are very present at this conference, actually. Um, so it, it actually provides me, I'm thinking through sort of my, I, it's been a deeply disturbing experience being here at these conversations about transdisciplinarity and what it's meaning. And, uh, but they're talking about a lot of similar things and I'm struggling a bit to wrap my my mind still around what you mean by modest. And that might be because I'm so embedded here right now that really I was just hearing pragmatic, 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 because that is what I'm hearing at this conference, right? That's the Dutch pragmatism as we need to. So at, at this conference, I've heard about the, the need to redistribute knowledge, responsibility, accountability, technology, everything except wealth or power every other thing that can be redistributed, we're talking about it endlessly. Well, how can we redistribute this and this and this? But as soon as you try to bring up 
the redistributive ownership or anything like this, it the conversation is over because now it's not it's not pragmatic anymore. We can't actually deal with what's happening. We know that capitalism is it, just mind-blowingly excellent at incorporating, internalizing, transforming its critiques into new ways to profit, right? This is, I mean, I think for a lot of us, this is the biggest, uh, the, one of the craziest things if we read Marx and then read it now is just how these critiques are just internalized and this kind of movement that was so expected just became this constant production of new ways of profiting. And so I, I find it really interesting and I wanted to, I guess, hone the question in a bit more in this in particular point you put on the slide of, of not being about the what you call the narrow focus on ownership in capitalism and socialism. And I'm, I, from my experience now in an institution in the global north, what I'm finding after a few days is that that feels dangerous to, to lose that focus because what I'm seeing here is without that focus, we're talking about they're learning from cities in the global south. We need, you know, technologies that fit here that are heterogeneous to solve this problem. Now we need to not think too much about the power dynamics and just do it. And um, yeah, I'm curious about how you, um, yeah, maybe if you could tell a bit more about what you think and how this relates specifically to your idea of the modest. That's what I'm trying to wrap my head around. Really, what you mean and its distinction from pragmatic or something like this. Does that make sense? It does. It does. And and there's, um, I said in the very beginning that that it's always difficult to choose for your audience which piece of the book to talk about um, because the the reason Tyler and I, we wrote a couple of articles together and we went, it was actually me, I had to convince Tyler. He was like, articles are what we do for our jobs and books are big. And I, I say this in jest, I'm watching his face. I was like, we, we have to tell the story all together because the individual pieces by themselves don't add up to a compelling story. They're interesting, they're useful, but but what we need is, is the whole pieces. And so again, you, you've you gotten the urban infrastructure slice today, and then you got one slide with like two bullet points on the economics. So so here's the, the unpolished version that summarizes that chapter. We're not saying don't focus on economic radical, economic change. It's to say that the, the words capitalism and socialism as they are often used in politics and the academy, miss the things that we think really matter. And if we, not always, not all of them, again, Eric Olin Wright's writing is, is very central to what we do. Gibson Graham is very central to what we do. But what we try to do is to tease out some of those ideas into saying the classic differences between capitalism and socialism are still within the sphere of modern. And if we go back further in history, we can see that the, the anti-capitalist struggles and the anti-feudalist struggles also contain seeds of a different thing. And we don't have good language for that different thing. And if we look in African cities and African rural areas at what their economies looked like and when their economies were more and less equal, our contemporary vocabulary fails us. And so we get stuck in these polarizing academic and political discourses between two words, neither which, again, socialism can mean a million different things to a million different people. And so for, for me, and I think I feel this way a little more strongly than Tyler, I, I find it it's, it's counterproductive for us to get stuck in whether or not what we should do is repackage an old term that some people like and some people don't. And instead, what we are trying to articulate is we need economic justice which includes the redistribution of wealth and people not having to work so much in order to have basic goods. And who owns what is part of that, but not the only piece of that that matters. And I don't think the solution is a single answer. Everyone should work for a worker-owned cooperative. Sometimes worker-owned cooperatives are incredibly racist and sexist and patriarchal and and, 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 and. Plus, there's not enough work for everyone. But we don't need everybody to be working. Both of those things. Overproduction is a piece of the, right? So, so part of degrowth and what it struggles with is to say, well, if we shrink the economy, then how do people get an income? So what we're trying to do is put those pieces together on the table, not in separate silos, but to say, we put that all together on the table. We need a, an economy that is also diverse. 
diverse economies sort of exist in the literature, but then we don't have a way to say what a good diverse economy is. And so we try to add some vocabulary there, which is not concentrated. And that is both to not have one big giant monopoly of worker cooperatives across the planet, but it's also not to say that we need to know that there's one single answer for what works in different cultures, in different histories, there will be different kinds of answers. And that what matters is precisely the things you said. It's the distribution and the power. And that's what we should be centralizing. And so to, to echo where you started, which was to say, those are the pieces we need to put on the table. And if we wanna build alliances, at least where I come from, which is Kansas, Oklahoma, middle red America, those old words will never get us there. Because whichever word you use, somebody likes it, hates it, and stops listening. Yeah, I can add a couple. So, I mean, just speaking like really directly to a couple of your points, I mean, I, I feel similarly to uh, your feelings about modest with pragmatism. I'm like, I don't really know what that means. Um, but I have this intuitive feeling the way you're talking about it, I don't like it. Um, I would say that like, for me, it's all about power relations. And actually I, I would say we should pay more attention to power, not less. And part of why I come to this critique and this thinking um, that sort of pushes against heavily state-centered solutions um, for instance, to ownership questions um, is because I work primarily with indigenous communities um, and a lot of projects of uh, development, both like under, uh, you know, the guise of capital, but also the guise of public development have been dispossessive. And uh, in, you know, the history of colonization, I think it's it's difficult to say that like a universal solution for all um, is really what people want. I think like indigenous people want autonomy, not uh, the people I work with don't uh, um, want a universal state with like universal standardized services with universalized like entitlements. Um, I think they've had a really long time fighting against the imposition of universal norms. Um, so for me, I would say that um, coming from that, the kind of that decolonial critique, um, the question is, is not about how to pay less attention to power and be pragmatic. I don't like that. Um, the question is like, how do we pay more attention to power in a way that like recognizes its, its extra economic um, forms and develop solution to redistribution that also ensure um, the empowerment across a diverse sort of set of axes without trying to like um, get lost in like intersectional matrices that try to do math to like say how much goes where based on which. It is true that your book sparked a very rich discussion. But looking at the time, maybe we can uh, collect one more question. Uh, does any one of you has a question? Luca. Yes, uh, th thanks a lot. There is no time to con con congratulate, you, but, but I, I think it's really, really useful work trying to, to, to move us beyond blocks and, and exploring territory. So thanks. Um, you you uh, okay you don't like the word pragmatist by main impression again it's maybe wrong that you do focus a lot on practices um, in and and uh, so my question would be um the way you see practices can practices transform institutions and how does that happen but also maybe do they need to maybe in your view you don't need uh, to transform institutions you can just uh, do uh, practice be, be within the tracks, the cracks of this institution. How do you see that? Yeah. Uh, 
I, I think what, sometimes there's there's too easy of slipping with words too. And, and I think what, what we try to propose is something that is very rooted in practice and what's possible. And I think in some ways that is what differentiates our argument from some others where you might love the modern ideal. I think many of us would really like for a flush toilet to eventually be possible, green and sustainable. And the, the version of pragmatism that I think is useful is the one that says, but but that's not real. It's not rooted in the reality of the world that we have. The reason why I, I, I try to analytically not use the word pragmatism is I think pragmatism often hides, it becomes an easy way to hide the, the analysis. Pragmatic, we're just gonna do that because that's the obvious common sense solution. Um, some people have used that word to say that the switch to these other kinds of infrastructures is pragmatic. And what we're trying to say is, no, they're informed by a really different understanding of the world. And that different understanding of the world is worth articulating because it helps us to understand why these switches are happening. It's because the modern belief is based on a problematic understanding of nature and a problematic understanding of what justice is. And that is grounded in practice. You know, remember from the, from the slides that all of what we're drawing, well, for me, all of the toilet stuff I'm drawing from is, let's take seriously the fact that in real life, people are already doing this stuff and then draw from there, what are all these different implications? And, and I do, I, I, one of the places I'm really interested to spend more time with is, um, is in Durban where the institutions are having to change because the toilets are changing, right? They don't know what to do, but they know that what they were doing isn't working. These different kinds of toilets demand that the state changes, which is a very STS kind of way to say it, but I think it works in this case because the big state cannot own all of these alternative technologies. They just can't do it. And they know that, and they don't even want to, some of them. So those practices, those toilets, and not to overdo it, like the tour, but a little lighter, those, those are actually demanding change. And the institution is trying, I, I think, some people who work for the state are problematic, but a lot of them are trying. And, and I think looking at places like that where there is hope for reshaping institutions in response to the climate, the injustice, the politics, the demands means part of what we try to do here is let's help folks articulate the demands that they can make of those different institutions. Thank you. I think we are we are uh, the the time. Uh, <laughs> um, but um, it would be nice to continue this discussion. If any of our colleagues would have some questions, also through email, would it be available for me to put you in contact for both of you, of course. Um, so, um, Maria, I don't know if you want to just say. Yeah, just a final thanks to uh, Mary and Tyler and a big thanks to Francesca for organizing this as well. And to all of you for a great debate. It's very clear that we need at least one more hour but more <laughs> to do justice uh, to the richness of the debate in the book. Uh, so we hope we can uh, arrange that at some uh, future point, um, because I'm sure, uh, you know, we all, um, I can see from faces, we're all eager to ask more, but yeah, again, if you're happy to take some email questions or maybe we can uh, organize another follow-up. Thank you, uh, both the authors, Mary and Tyler, for this. Thank you, Francesca, for organizing. Thank you, everybody, for being here. It's been a, a real pleasure. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Coffee chat sometime. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good idea. Yeah, definitely. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.